Hello, my name is Will Green, and I'm one of the pastors and the director of discipleship at Foundry United Methodist Church in Washington, D.C. This series, titled Lectures on Lament, was designed to help deepen our understanding of the experience and expression of Christian lament as a spiritual discipline. Together, we will explore the deep gifts that both individual and communal lament hold for the life of discipleship and identify concrete ways to incorporate it into our daily lives. In this first lecture, Dr. Elizabeth Hall of Biola University offers a framework for understanding the historical and scriptural expression of Christian lament. It is this, she argues, that helps us find ways through individual and communal suffering and ultimately receive the liberation from suffering only lament can fully provide. Thank you. I'm, I'm thrilled to be here uh, with you today. Uh, the pandemic has all kinds of disadvantages, but one of the advantages <clears throat> is that I can be here from my home in California uh, visiting with you on this uh, Sunday morning slash uh, early afternoon for you all. Our topic for today is lament. And while lament is an ancient practice that has roots going all the way back to early Judaism, it seems a very, very relevant topic for us in this particular season. Globally, we've all been affected by the pandemic and it's caused massive disruptions to our day-to-day -day lives as evidenced by the fact that you all are sitting in your various locations while we are uh, meeting as we uh, have done as Christians for centuries on this Sunday. We know that over 2 million people have lost their lives worldwide. Uh, many more have lost friends and family. Economies have been disrupted. People have been threatened with poverty. There have been huge social and political consequences that may persist for years. And of course, the disproportionate impact of the pandemic on the most vulnerable in our society has really heightened and uncovered these fault lines of longstanding uh, inequities that we now have to deal with uh, as we should. And so suffering has touched all of our lives. The good news is that we are not left to cope with our suffering alone. Uh, we have a God who invites us to cast our burdens on God because God cares for us. And so lament uh, is a specific way of doing this. Like other Christian practices, such as fasting or meditation on scripture or communion, lament is a spiritual discipline because its regular practice is intended to shape us in the developmental pathways of our faith. So specifically, lament is a powerful practice for embedding us in the Christian story, helping us to find meaning in our times of suffering. Uh, slide, please. So if you were to search in dictionaries for the definition of lament, you would find that it, the definition is that it is to express sorrow, regret, or unhappiness about something. Next slide. Or a formal expression of sorrow or mourning, especially in a verse or song. But biblical lament is actually much more than this. It's not just an expression of deep sorrow. It's an expression to a specific person, to God. It's not just a, uh, uh, an expression of deep emotion, but it also calls out to God for action. And biblical lament differs radically from these secular versions of lament in one other way, that usually it ends in exuberant praise to God. Lament is found extensively throughout the Old Testament, most clearly in the Psalms, where some uh, scholars think that up to 40% are actually Psalms of lament. And these passages of lament are referenced extensively in the New Testament. As a practicing Jew, uh, Jesus would have participated in the communal praying and singing of the Psalms, including these Psalms of lament. This formed the backdrop for his own personal practice of lament. Jesus consistently brought his suffering before God. As we read here on the slide, Hebrews 5, 7 says, in the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. When Jesus was faced with the suffering of others, such as when Lazarus died, he lamented. When faced with his own upcoming death in the Garden of Gethsemane, he lamented. And even on the cross, he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Where he was quoting from Psalm 22. <clears throat> 
a psalm of lament. Shortly after, Jesus quotes from yet another psalm of lament. Psalm five, crying out, Father, into your hands, I commend my spirit before dying. So when we follow Jesus's example in responding to suffering, we find at our disposal the resources that Jesus himself drew on, including lament. But why is lament such a powerful discipline for those who are going through times of suffering? Well, suffering is disorienting. It shakes up our assumptions about our place in the world, about the way that things should be. Slide, please. Psychologist Crystal Park offers a model for understanding why hard things cause suffering. According to her model, Hard things cause suffering when there is a discrepancy or a gap between our worldview on the one hand and our understanding of the difficult event in our life. For example, as a lifelong Christian, I believe in a God who is love. It's an important part of my worldview. So in December of 2013, uh, I was diagnosed with stage two breast cancer. And my initial understanding of the cancer diagnosis as a threat to my life and a potential tragedy to my husband and to my sons was incompatible. It was in tension with my view of God as a loving God. Now, according to Park, to reduce distress, people must adjust their views of the event or revise their worldview goals and beliefs to be able to accommodate the new information. And this process of trying to bring these two uh, ways of thinking about the world into harmony with each other is a process of meaning making. <clears throat> so meaning making is a crucial coping mechanism when we are faced with times of suffering. And this is where the structure of lament comes in. Slide please. In praying through the lament, the structure of the lament begins to restore some sense of order in the midst of chaos. So much like many of the other rituals in life, it allows us to make transitions, to uh, go through transitions. So things like wedding ceremonies or funerals or graduations all provide a kind of st structure that allows us to move into new ways of being in the world. The structure of these rituals helps us to create and transition to that new meaning. So similarly, the structure of, of lament helps us to organize and facilitates that process of meaning making in suffering. It moves us from disorientation to a new orientation in the world. It also helps us to find words <clears throat> to express the experience of our suffering. I'm a clinical psychologist, and uh, so as a therapist, I know the power of helping people to articulate through a good uh, uh, interpretation the suffering that they are experiencing but are having a difficulty putting into words. So it's important for people to be able to do this, and the Psalms help with that. But verbalization of the suffering is also important because it allows us to bring our suffering into a relationship with another person. Now, words don't simply express our experiences. It also, words also help to shape our experience. Slide, please. Writing of lament, uh, theologian Walter Brueggemann notes, language does not simply follow reality, reflect it, but it leads reality to become what it is not. The speaker calls forth new reality. And so that shape of lament that I've been talking about <clears throat> causes our verbalized experience to be molded by encountering the reality of God and God's character. And so when we express our suffering in the form of lament, when we allow our experiences to be shaped by the words of lament, our experience itself is transformed. So in the remainder of our time together, I'd like to briefly walk you through the different components of lament. Slide, please. The Psalms of lament typically begin by a crying out to God. So uh, slide, please. So Psalm 13, which I'm gonna be using as an example for uh, says, how long Lord, that's how it starts out. Now lament is, by definition, an engagement with God. So it's not 
a lonely catharsis. It's not merely an expression of our feelings. It's not grumbling to others behind God's back as the Israelites were chastised for doing during their wanderings of, in the desert. So one really crucial element in biblical lament has to do with the fact that we can bring all of our experiences, including our suffering, to God. Now, from a relational exper uh, uh, perspective, this is absolutely crucial because when we take our experiences to God, we can take initiative in the relationship with God and we can expect God to respond to us. Consider the alternative. Uh, we've all been in relationships where we didn't actually matter that much, maybe in a relationship to a professor or, or a boss. In those relationships, the other person called all of the shots. We had no confidence that attempts to bring our own concerns or needs or preferences into the relationship would be attended to in any kind of way. As you might remember, uh, those kinds of relationships lack any kind of intimacy because intimacy requires responsiveness on the part of the other person. Now, the relationship with God could very well take this form. After all, God is all powerful. Our interactions with God could be limited to simply responding to his greatness and worship, for example, instead of also being responded to. But God is not that kind of a God. Our God is one who invites expression of our concerns and needs, and it responds to them in much the way that an attuned mother attends to her child. As we look back at the Psalms of Lament through the perspective of the cross, this relational dimension to the Psalms, to the crying out, becomes even more intimate. While the Jews did have an image of God as a father, this was actually not a central part of how they thought about God. But Jesus's use of Abba to refer to God, which is a term of intimacy, was adopted by Paul, who encouraged believers in his turn to go before God in the certainty that God was their loving Heavenly Father. And so when we cry out to God and lament, we can cry out to him as our Abba Father. Slide, please. In the second component of lament, the cause of the suffering is brought before God in complaint. The threat and loss of meaning in the face of suffering is also expressed. Slide, please. Psalm 13, for example, says, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Slide, please. There's actually a remarkable array of uh, complaints that are brought to God in suffering. These include bodies that are not working well, disease and pain, disappointments in life, depression, people who, through no fault of our own, have become our enemies, people who lie about us and take us to court and scheme to shame us and take advantage of us, friends who abandon us in our moment of need, who turn on us and who return trouble for all the good that we have done to them. But the most startling thing about the complaint element of lament is that often God himself is the focus. Slide, please. These complaints against God often take the form of two fundamental questions. God, where are you? And God, if you love me, then why? It would appear that nothing is off limits when it comes to expressing our suffering to God. Doubts about God, anger against God, even hatred of our enemies. God is open to us expressing honestly whatever is in our hearts. Again, this is remarkable. In our other relationships, our honesty is often often bounded by power differentials in the relationship, by concern for the well-being of others, by fear of the rejection of others. But God alone is big enough to deal with absolute honesty with what is in our hearts. This expression of suffering is crucial in lament because in lament, our suffering is not denied and our suffering is not minimized. Suffering is not dealt with by explaining it away or by distracting ourselves from it. It's recognized. And in so doing, our experience of suffering is legitimized. 
Psychological research suggests that processing the suffering cognitively and emotionally is necessary for growth to occur through our suffering. The time that we send, spend sitting in our suffering, the time we spend wrestling with issues of meaning is crucial. And in fact, some research even suggests that the amount of growth that we experience through our suffering is directly related to the amount of time spent in intentional engagement with our suffering. Putting our suffering into words to assist in engagement with suffering allows it to be processed in this way. But again, there is an even more important value to our being able to put our suffering into words that it allows us to bring it into the interpersonal realm. It allows us to share our burdens with somebody else. Even in the relationship with God, who presumably knows already everything that's in our hearts, voicing our suffering brings with it the intentionality of bringing it to the shared attention of us in our relationship with God. And the shared intention is a crucial element of intimacy. Slide, please. While avoiding our suffering is not helpful, neither is it helpful to get stuck in our complaint. And so in this third element of lament, the request, God is acknowledged as the one who can actually do something about our suffering. Slide, please. In Psalm 13, for example, the request is, look on me and answer, Lord my God, give light to my eyes. The acknowledgement of God's power that is implicit in the request introduces hope into the process of lament. When we ask God to act on our behalf, uh, we are reminded that God can act to change situations. Hope is an absolutely essential element uh, in meaning making and consequently to our flourishing and well being. In fact, uh, hope is a common element in all psychological theories uh, of meaning. Research shows that hope is intrinsic to a sense of meaning in life, and that when we statistically separate out hope, from a sense of meaning, the inverse relationships between meaning and both depression and anxiety disappears. In other words, in plain English, hope is what helps meaning translate into better psychological outcomes. Our meaning making must include hope for it to bring us to a better place. Research also supports this claim. So an, another study found that hope mediated the relationship between a sense of meaning in life and a, a sense of well-being. In other words, hope is one of the reasons why people with a sense of meaning in life are also people who flourish. And the research uh, interestingly shows that people who identify with a religion tend to report greater hope. Now, when psychologists study hope, they tend to study a psychological construct that it's, it's rather vague. Uh, it expresses a kind of optimism about the future. But hope has a distinct theological focus in scripture. That focus is one that puts our suffering in the context of God making everything whole, including ourselves at the end of time. Slide, please. For example, in 2 Corinthians 4, Paul says, our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Glory here appears to be a kind of shorthand for salvation and more specifically for that part of salvation that has to do with the process of transforming us uh, into Christ-likeness. So the particular content of hope from a Christian perspective is very important because faith does not pit our current suffering against that glory that is to come. If it did, then our faith would indeed be a faith that silences the sufferer by simply distracting us from our current circumstances. But instead, our hope legitimizes our experience of suffering, and it does this in at least two ways. So first of all, it actually changes, it transforms the suffering itself 
uh, to be a kind of mechanism that can lead to that outcome. Our suffering helps to transform us into that glorious Christ likeness that is uh, to come. Second, the difficult events in our life are not diminished by minimizing their consequences or by denying their existence. Instead, our the resolution of our pain is achieved by seeing our present experiences, our present afflictions against the backdrop of our eschatological hope. We're reminded, in other words, that we live in a transitional age, that our current suffering, uh, profound as it may seem to us in the moment, is transient, but our future hope is eternal. Christ has defeated suffering and death but we're still living in anticipation of the end of that story. So there's still need for lament in our hope. We groan as we wait to use the language of Romans 8. Our suffering doesn't disappear, but it is set in a different context, not the context of our current life and our current hopes and our current dreams, but the much larger, and to use the biblical word, the more glorious, reality of our future hope. And that context can make all of the difference. Slide, please. The motivation component of lament is the one that might sound the strangest to our modern sensibilities. So the Psalms of lament often seem to include reasons why God should answer the petition. To put it in plain terms, the psalmists seem to engage in a kind of divine arm twisting as if that's what it took uh, to get God to uh, respond. So there are some common reasons uh, in the Psalm 13 that we're looking at and also other Psalms that are given uh, for why God should intervene. His reputation, uh, his consistency with past actions, uh, a promise of praise, the helplessness of the speaker or the speaker's trust in God. Slide, please. In Psalm 13, for example, we find, or I will sleep in death and my enemy will say, I have overcome him and my foes will rejoice when I fall. Now, regardless of the intent of the psalmist in reminding God of why God should act, uh, this component of lament, reminding God of his motivation to act, can actually be an important in our own lives. So maybe not to remind God that uh, we really expect God to act, but important in reminding us that God is God. This reminder has a couple of different uh, uh, aspects to it, kind of different sides of the same coin. The first is a reminder of our position before God. God is God and we are not. God is the creator and we are the creature. God is omniscient, omniscient omnipotent, omnipresent. We are not. Suffering does us the service of making our own limitations very, very clear to us. It provides us with an opportunity to acknowledge our finitude, our vulnerability, our lack of control. In other words, our need for God. And ironically, the psychological research shows that the more overwhelming we experience our circumstances to be, the more out of control we feel, the greater the amount of growth that can come out of that suffering. We need God. Intimacy with God is not the kind of intimacy that we have with a buddy. It's more like the intimacy of a parent and child in cosmic proportions. And so lament reminds us of our position in relationship to God. But the other side of that coin is that our divine arm twisting also reminds us of the character of God we're reminded of how God has powerfully acted in the past and we're reminded of God's name. God is a just God. He's also powerful and he can act on behalf of the sufferer. So when we bring our suffering to God, we're reminded of who God is. The very act of crying out to God can shape us relationally, reminding us of who God is and of who we are in relationship to God. Slide, please. The last component, the most surprising of all the components found in all of the Psalms of Lament but one, is the expression of confidence 
in God that comes at the end. The transition to praise is completed here. This transition is often marked by the very small word, but. And this small word signals a large contrast, a movement into a new way of experiencing reality. It signals a line that is crossed in which the focus shifts from one centered on the psalmist in his own pain to one that is centered on God. This transition can be quite abrupt. Uh, leading uh, Walter Brueggemann, for example, to say this movement from plea to praise is one of the most startling in all of Old Testament literature. Slide, please. For example, Psalm 13 ends, but I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise for he has been good to me. The puzzling thing is to try to figure out what causes this shift to praise and worship. This is actually not clear in the Psalms of Lament. Uh, they're silent regarding why or how this shift to praise has occurred. Maybe God has already acted, maybe. But my own sense is that something else has happened here, that there is a shift that is internal rather than external, that is based on a psychological and a spiritual shift that happens inside of us rather than a change in our external circumstances. Based on my experiences uh, doing research and interviewing many, many people in positions of suffering, I think that the transition occurs because of the surrender to God that the earlier parts of lament facilitate. Slide, please. Even when God has not yet acted, that movement through the lament can lead the sufferer to this place of praise and worship. As we pray through the Psalms, as we call out to God, as we pour out our hearts and petition to God, as we allow ourselves to be reminded of who God is, our desires and our affections and our perspectives are reshaped. It's pretty clear that suffering itself does not necessarily lead to worship. We all know people who have faced suffering and have emerged on the other side, bitter and alienated from God. So what is it about engaging with our suffering and lament before God that leads to the kind of intimacy that expresses itself in this kind of praise and worship of God? I think it does boil down to this one thing, to surrender. In our everyday lives, we may acknowledge who we are in relationship to God. We may even intentionally cultivate attitudes of humility before God. But like Job, we are never entirely stripped of our claim on autonomy, self-determination, and control of our own lives until we hit the wall of our own utter helplessness in the face of what we most desperately want. And if we're wise, that will lead us to acknowledge what has been true all along, that we are finite, that we are created for a dependent relationship with a loving, omniscient, omnipresent God. When we are made to face this truth, we can then lovingly enter into that relationship in the form of surrender. And so in wrapping up today, I just want to recommend to you the practice of lament. There's value in simply praying through the existing Psalms of lament as the ancient Israelites did as their as part of their worship. Or you may want to use these components of lament to create your own psalms of lament to express yourself before God. The psalms can powerfully help us to put words to our experiences, but again, they do much more than that. They don't simply reflect experience, they shape experience. And so the way out of suffering turns out to not be around it, but through it, and the Psalms of Lament can offer us some guidance as we go down this difficult path. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Hall, for your presentation. Uh, we're going to open up the floor now for questions. And so let me ask um, if you're able to use the raise your hand feature, if you've got questions you'd like to direct to, to Dr. Hall, uh, or you can also use the chat function. So the floor is the floor is yours. 
The first question is always the hardest one. <laughs> Who will unmute themselves and speak out? Well, maybe Dr. Hall, just to get us started, I would love your reflections on how people can operationalize lament in their lives. So um, in addition to this amazing framework that you've offered us, what disciplines or practices or tools do you recommend for people who are trying to access um, their own lament? Yeah. Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, you know, I mentioned in my talk uh, that I was diagnosed with breast cancer uh, back in 2013. And uh, you know, it's amazing to me that lament that's so pervasive in our Bibles is something that we don't hear very much around our Christian circles these days. And so back in 2013 and 2014 and that long year of treatment that followed, uh, I was left a bit to my own devices in trying to find meaning in my own suffering. Uh, and so often what I would do is I would turn to the Psalms and I would reflect on them, right? And that reflection uh, on the Psalms would then take me and it, of course, uh, you know, crying out to God and uh, uh, for his mercy in, in my situation. And that would often lead me to the place where the psalmist could then, uh, with the psalmist, I could express my trust and confidence in God. So it's interesting that I think that intuitively uh, I went to the structure of lament, even having never heard of lament. Uh, that intuitively I went to those psalms of lament. And so uh, I would say that uh, even being more intentional about that particular practice can be helpful. Not just, for example, reading through a psalm of lament, uh, but spending time sitting with the reality of it, right? Uh, interspersing the words of the psalmist with our own cries to God in our particular situations. Uh, I think that that is a, a very powerful way of, uh, of sitting in lament. Now it does require, and I know this is difficult in our busy lives, it does require carving out a space for ourselves. I mean, I'm a busy professional woman. I have a full-time job. Uh, I have you know, a, an active family. Uh, I'm active in my church. My, my resources are limited and I'm spread uh, often very thin. Uh, and so for myself, I know that it took something like a cancer diagnosis to force me to actually spend an extended period of time silent before God, right? Uh, spending that time to, um, uh, to sit with the words of scripture and to try to articulate my own experiences before God. So, uh, you know, the interesting thing uh, about the Psalms of Lament is that um, if, we, if we become familiar with them, in our ordinary lives, it seems to me that the process of uh, benefiting from them in times of suffering is accelerated. Because if our hearts are already shaped during times when we're not enduring uh, a suffering, intense suffering, then perhaps when we do hit those hard times that all of us face, uh, the path is a little more straightforward. We don't have to like flail around quite so much to try to figure out how to make our way through it. Thank you. Kate, I'm seeing your question in the chat. Would you like to ask that directly? And I think, yeah. There we go. Um, I'm just really interested in hearing more about, about your thoughts about this concept of surrender. Um, I work with young adults with autism and um, who are very high functioning. And often I feel as though there is a lack of surrender. Um, a surrender to their diagnosis, a surrender to an acceptance of who they are as people. And, and it's, uh, it's almost as though they, there's a fight. And I wonder if that's a similar parallel to what you're talk, speaking of. I think so. Uh, I mean, I can understand that situation well, right? Uh, when, when things that are unwanted come into our lives, the, you know, our, our initial reaction is certainly to push as hard as we can against it, right? And, you know, again, as a clinical psychologist, I don't want to diminish the importance of that. So there is a way in which being as active as possible in facing our sufferings is, is a great good, right? Uh, so the, the challenge comes in when in balancing out doing as much as we possibly can and recognizing what 
is out of our control, recognizing the things that we can't change, right? And so that's where the surrender comes in, is uh, just recognizing, again, who we are, that there are things that are simply beyond our capacity to change. I do think that there are a couple of other reasons why surrender can be a challenge sometimes. Uh, I think that surrender is often confused with passivity or with giving up, right? And so there are a couple of aspects of the kind of surrender that I'm talking about that need to be very, very clear. One of them is that it is an active process. So there's nothing passive about the kind of surrender that I'm talking about. It is the choice to intentionally and in an ongoing way bring our suffering and our circumstances to God, right? Uh, it's interesting that verse that uh, I, I quoted where Jesus entrusted himself to God, the, the verb tense is actually kind of a kept entrusting. It suggests that it was kind of this ongoing thing that Jesus did. And that's certainly part of the active part of surrender. Uh, the other thing that I would uh, suggest is really an intrinsic part of surrender uh, of the kind that I'm talking about is that it's it's a, a loving action. And what I mean by that is uh, it's not the kind of surrender that a an army that is defeated does to its captors, right? Grudgingly and unwillingly, simply because the other person has the bigger guns, right? Instead, it's... it's uh, it's surrender uh, that we can do in love because we know that we are doing the surrendering to a God who is not only omnipotent, omniscient, and that kind of thing, but is love, right? And is loving toward us and God's purposes toward us. And so that's, a, I think, a different kind of surrender uh, altogether. Thank you, Dr. Hall. Um, we've got two other questions. Stephen, yours is first in the chat. Would you like to ask that directly or would you like for me to look? I will. I've been raised throughout my life as a United Methodist that we don't negotiate with God. And arm twisting seems a kind of negotiating process. So I would like you to give an example of, of how you would uh, twist God's arm <laughs> during during a pandemic. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you for that question. Yeah, I have to admit, you know, that part of the Psalms of Lament, and here, you know, I'm not relying on my own scholarship because I'm not a theologian. Uh, so Pemberton is the, the name of the theologian who has uh, come up with that kind of division of the, the Psalms of Lament. Uh, you know, he, he expresses, and I resonate with the sense that this is kind of puzzling. I mean, we don't know what aspect of kind of the ancient Hebrew culture is reflected in that arm twisting. So, uh, you know, I, I would agree with you that I don't know that arm twisting is a particularly uh, good way of interfacing with God. What I do suggest, though, is that in that component of lament, we can uh, we can facilitate our own meaning making by um, reminding ourselves as we remind God of who God is and what God has done in our lives. Right. So when we stop and think about the ways that God has been faithful to us in the past the ways that God has preserved us, the ways that God has taken very difficult situations and has used them for our good, then we can benefit from uh, what, you know, Pemberton calls that arm twisting of God. Yeah. And Catherine, did you wanna ask a question? Yes, my question was, if you're going through the stages of lament, how do you identify being stuck in your relationship with God and perhaps the need for therapy, you know, and the second part of it was how do you, how do people around you affect the decision of whether it is surrender or their, or your failure to understand, or their failure to understand the process of lament? Okay, let me answer that first question, and then maybe I'll have you revisit the, the second one so I can make sure that I'm understanding you. Uh, it's a challenging question. How do you know? Um, so my bent is that it is never, it's never a bad idea to bring a trust, tr trusted other person into your experience of lament, right? Because often other people uh, see things that we don't 
And they're often in a position to um, help nudge us if we do end up needing uh, professional help to help get us unstuck from wherever we are, right? Uh, I'm reluctant to set just like a, a time frame on it because obviously different kinds of suffering, uh, what's normal in those situations, you know, can vary quite a bit uh, across circumstances and even across people. But I would say that when uh, the complaint is starting to become rigid, when it's starting to become something that is kind of set in stone, that that is definitely a time to be prompted to take kind of, uh, you know, uh, more definitive steps to, to get outside help. So uh, I realize that that's a bit of a vague answer. Uh, I'm having a hard time articulating what would be a more concrete step. But again, often people, loved ones close to us are in a better place than we are to help point out uh, when we might be getting stuck in the, in the complaint, in, in our, our feelings about the particular situation. I also think that lament is kind of cyclical. Uh, you know, I, uh, I think that sometimes we can arrive, you know, kind of at the end of the journey at a place of praise. And then uh, because we are human, right? Uh, a few days or a few weeks later, we find that the complaints resurface. And so often growth takes a kind of a cyclical form, right? It's not linear. It, it, it is cyclical. And so we just need to have patience with ourselves because we are, we are finite, right? And uh, we, we do sometimes need a little more time to uh, arrive at that complete trust in God that uh, we aspire to. Kevin, you, 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 answered you answered my second question. I did, okay. okay. If you bring other people into the process, then you do allow for their judgments to come into play. Thank you. Wonderful. Uh, Lois, do you want to ask your question next? Thank you. Uh, my question is that um, it appears to me that suffering may be situational or it may be systemic. And um, we struggle very often in our society with um, injustices, uh, when we lack radical hospitality, there are all kinds of situations that seem to permeate uh, the, the landscape. How may we offer lament as a means to healing in this swamp of systemic suffering so that people just don't throw it away as a, a tool yeah. uh, that can be very helpful? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that's a very weighty question. Um, so one thing I would point out is that even when suffering is caused by systemic issues, that as individuals, we all still feel the effects of that, some more than others, right? So the suffering continues to be individual, even when the injustice uh, that we are facing is systemic. So uh, I think that even there, there is a room for individual lament. But let me bring up another aspect of lament that I actually did not highlight during my talk. And it's that uh, generally uh, lament as it was practiced by the ancient uh, Israelites was communal. The Psalms was uh, kind of their hymn book, right? And so this was something that they would often do in community. And I think that when injustice is systemic, one of the powerful ways that we can set ourselves against it as groups, as communities, is to engage in communal lament around it. When we join with others, even if we're not the ones who are directly affected by the injustice, when we join with our brothers and sisters who are the primary recipients of the injustice in the form of communal lament, that that can be a powerful statement of solidarity uh, with, with others. Because again, uh, whether the situation, whether it's individual situational circumstances or whether it is larger systemic ones, God continues to be the only one that can act, that can resolve situations, that can uh, bring uh, healing and justice uh, ultimately. Wonderful. 
Seeing no other questions in the chat, are there other questions that folks might like to raise for Dr. Hall? Patricia, I see your hand. Would you like to? And you're muted, so I'm going to invite you to unmute. Ah, yeah. yeah. This is following on a question that was already asked, but it's something that troubles me as somebody who has too much anxiety, thankfully not downright panic attacks, but still too much. And one of the temptations is to get too upset and in a way surrender to something and, and think of it as worse than maybe objectively it is. And I think a lot of times there must be two different ways of defining surrender, the kind that you meant and the kind that is often used. I just read a book called, of all things, Thunderdog because the man is blind and he has a dog and there's a reason he called the book that. He's afraid of thunder, but she let him out of the World Trade Center safely. <laughs> the thing is, he never did what you would call surrender to being blind. Neither did his parents. And he ran into a coffee table when he was four years old, just slammed right into it in his little pedal car. And after he got stitched up, his mother's comment to him was, you just have to watch out more carefully. He learned echolocation from that. Uh, in fact, at one point after college, he had to be reminded he was being a bit arrogant. <laughs> but he could, well, he was the uh, managing sales agent for a big company that had offices in the World Trade Center and flew all over the world and all that kind of thing. And according to him, being blind is a, nuisance and it's just made a real nuisance by the way society is set up not to credit blind people with what they can do and I was just amazed at the attitude there so can you distinguish the two kinds of surrender because obviously he knew he was blind but there was no sense of surrender to it kind of the contrary he just made it like well so what it doesn't matter and I don't think we usually think of it that way, and I think we probably should. Yeah, thank you. Uh, again, surrender is a, a tricky word. Uh, you know, I think that uh, before I started thinking about it in these terms, if you asked me about surrender, I would have thought of it as a kind of a negative psychological thing, right? A kind of giving up, a kind of, uh, you know, uh, just kind of giving in to circumstances. But again, uh, as you pointed out, Patricia, that's not at all what is in mind here, right? Uh, so I'm not even sure that this man's blindness is a good candidate for the kind of surrender that I'm talking about, right? Uh, because uh, it, it, at least in the parts of the story that you have shared with us, there are no indications of there being kind of a limit that this man bumped into where he recognized that he had gone as far as he could and that desired outcomes were beyond his control and that he needed to give them up, right? So, uh, so uh, again, I wanna be very careful to say that the kind of surrender that I'm talking about is not a failing to act in situations where we have the option of making our lives or the other lives of the people around us uh, better through action on our part, right? So there is definitely room for our collaborative work uh, with God, for example, in facing a diagnosis of cancer or in facing uh, blindness, doing everything we possibly can to treat the cancer, to make our lives better if we are faced with blindness, is not at all incompatible with surrender. <clears throat> now, I can't speak again to this man's situation, but the cancer in my case, uh, the, the situation was in recognizing that I could do every treatment available to me. Uh, but there might still be a point where the cancer could take over my body and cause me to die. And so my finitude in that case was acknowledging that my own mortality was out of my hands and that the well-being of my children, of my husband, was out of my hands and that that was something that I needed to entrust to God. And until I was able to do that, I could not be, uh, in a sense, at peace. I could not have that peace about the situation because those were pieces that I had no direct control over. So there, there's lots of room 
for active collaboration with God, uh, even as we practice spiritual surrender to God. Thank you for allowing me to highlight that even more, Patricia. I think that's an important distinction. Thank you. Are there, uh, seeing no other questions in the chat, are there other questions that folks might like to raise for Dr. Hall today? Well, I have a question. Yes. This is Cheryl Gibbs. Cheryl, I think you're muted. Could you? Cheryl, can you hear us? All right, well, we'll, we'll try to come back to Cheryl's question. Um, Oh, there she is. Wonderful. Yes, sorry about that. I'm bringing my question from my position as a supervisor in a you know, secular workplace where oftentimes uh, employees will bring a place of lament to me, but they're quick to say, I'm not a religious person or a spiritual person, but I have this situation or issue that is hurting or affecting my work. How do you counsel or help people who acknowledge that they're not in a particular spiritual place or a place of religious uh, foundation, but I want to help them because I know what God has done in my own life in helping me through certain situations and places of lament. Yeah, I mean, obviously that's gonna be bound, uh, bounded by whatever uh, kind of regulations or guidelines you have in your particular workplace. I can certainly understand the situation having worked myself uh, as a Christian in secular places. Um, you know, I would say that that is the role of testimony, right? That that is what God calls us to do is we can't make other people change their minds, but we can tell them, hey, this is what has happened to me. And I think that most uh, workplaces recognize the validity of us not imposing our beliefs on other people, but simply speaking of our own experience. And so in your particular situation, that might be the most you can do, Cheryl, is simply say, you know, when I have been in your situation, this has been what has been helpful to me, right? Um, I don't know that I can say much, much more than that, uh, except to say that uh, um, I think that speaking of our own experiences, is probably more powerful in the lives of other people than telling them, you know, what they should do. You know, that's often a more appealing way of letting people know of the hope that we have uh, than uh, than outright, you know, preaching or being more forceful about recommendations, which might be uncomfortable in your particular uh, workplace setting. Mm So we've got time for one last question, and I see that one's just been dropped into the chat. Sam, do you want to share your question? Sure. Um, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah, so um, what is the role and timing of repentance or personal regret in being ready to lament? I was in a group this morning and was wondering about whether getting actions, getting our own actions out of the way help us be ready to question God's action or inaction or the state of the world outside of our control? You know, several of the Psalms uh, of lament have to do with David bringing his own brokenness to God. And so uh, certainly I think the, the experience of guilt and the experience of shame and the act of repentance can be a robust part of what we bring to uh, uh, to the experience of lament. Now, interestingly, David didn't seem to be that concerned about waiting until he had confessed, until he cried out to God, right? And so um, from a human perspective, I think often, you know, I'm thinking of my relationship with my husband, it is more helpful when I acknowledge what I've done wrong before I bring up to him things and, you know, ways in which his behavior has hurt me, right? Um, but I think it's a wonderful thing that God is not limited by the ways that we have to do things in our own relationship to uh, in terms of engaging him, right? If, uh, if, we have, if we have to repent for something, but we are also angry at God, guess what? We get to express our anger at God 
Uh, and maybe the expression of that anger at God will leave us in a place where it is easier for us then to confess and come to a place of repentance for our role in, you know, in our current circumstances. So, uh, you know, certainly, uh, certainly repentance can, is, is an important part of lament when our suffering uh, is brought on because of our own actions, uh, as is forgiveness, by the way, right, uh, of people who, who have uh, hurt us. Uh, but I'm not sure that we have to worry that much about the sequencing uh, of events. Uh, again, David didn't seem to, you know, uh, he felt free to just as things were on his heart and all of its rawness and all of its inappropriateness, we might think, you know, from our position, uh, he felt free to express it to God. Lament, as we've learned today, is not an expression of faithlessness in God, but an act of profound faith toward God. As we've concluded each of these lectures, we've offered this blessing written by John O'Donohue and called For Suffering, which we now offer to you. May you be blessed in the holy names of those who, without knowing it, help to carry and lighten your pain. May you know serenity when you are called to enter the house of suffering. May a window of light always surprise you. May you be granted the wisdom to avoid false resistance. When suffering knocks on the door of your life, may you glimpse its eventual gifts, and may you be able to receive the fruits of suffering. May memory bless and protect you with the hard-earned life past travail, to remind you that you have survived before, and though the darkness is now deep, you will soon see approaching light. May the grace of time heal your wounds. May you know that though the storm may rage, not a hair of your head will be harmed. Until next time, friends, be gentle with yourselves and blessings on the journey. <laughs>